An important question I get asked often is, what's the biggest thing holding us back from improving our cities? Now, that's a question that has as many answers as the number of people you ask. If you were to ask Ontario's Department of Transportation, the answer would probably be too many bike lanes. That's a nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up. If you ask Urbanist Reddit, it would probably be something like too much car brain design or pro-car corruption. But if you've gone so far down the urbanist YouTube rabbit hole that you've managed to find my channel, you may want to know what the build the lanes answer is. Well, since I don't really consider myself an urbanist, I don't have a simple story with a clear hero and villain to sell to you. It's my sincere belief that the biggest challenge isn't political or some kind of car lobby fueled conspiracy. It's really just ignorance. Leslie, I, I typed your symptoms into the thing up here and it says you could have network connectivity problems. Mobility, at least in most of the world, isn't studied or advanced as a proper scientific field. It's something that everyone in the world has direct experience with. So instead, it's this field where everything is just assumed to be known. It's a field dominated by anecdotes, half-truisms, and the type of logic that would get an engineer working in any other field laughed out of any respectable institution. And this reason really is the entire motivation behind this channel. There's already tons of urbanist content out there, and you should definitely watch it. But YouTube doesn't need another urbanist channel. So Build the Lanes is where I'd like for people to come to actually learn about mobility through the amazing science that it is. What actually goes into being able to travel from A to B. Well, let's get into the basics. Last video, we learned how the theoretical capacity of a road is irrelevant to the flow of cars in the urban environment. If you haven't seen that video yet, link in the description. But that topic leads to another interesting question. Can higher traffic speeds mean higher traffic capacity? First and foremost, if this video is going to be anything resembling a good faith argument on this topic, we need to be clear on what kind of traffic we're talking about. Reflow or stop and go. I've already made a video talking about why these two are so fundamentally different, but if you're new here, the driving lane itself is a limiting factor in free flow traffic, and the intersection is a limiting factor in stop and go traffic. The difference between these two types is so fundamental that the Dutch have a separate road engineering manual to deal with each one, one for urban and one for rural. Let's start with free flow traffic. The good news is that the theoretical capacity of a free flow lane is already known, 1800 vehicles per hour. Great, but how do they get this number? Caution, math and multidimensional analysis ahead, but I'll try to make it as painless as possible. The formula to calculate car flow is car speed times the average following distance between cars times how much time passes. We can make several assumptions in this calculation. One, cars will be modeled as points of indeterminate size, and two, each car maintains an average following distance of two seconds. Let's try a calculation. We must convert the two seconds of following time to a distance. Let's assume a travel speed of 50 kilometers an hour. An object traveling 50 kilometers an hour will cover 27.8 meters distance after two seconds. Now we just need to plug all the numbers into the formula. Car speeds in meters per second, distance between each car, and the amount of time, which will be 3,600 seconds, since we are interested in the number of cars per hour. And voila, the result is 1,800 vehicles per hour. But what happens if the speed changes? For example, what if the speed is 30 kilometers per hour instead of 50? Let's run that calculation again. I went ahead and converted the speed to meters per second, and how many meters are traveled within two seconds to save some time. 
we plug these different numbers in, and once again, we get 1,800 vehicles per hour. Now, why is that? Because there is a one-for-one -one positive relationship between speed and following distance. If we take a closer look at the formula, the speed of the car is multiplied by the distance between two cars. But the distance between the two cars is determined also by speed. In this case, two seconds times the car speed. Since this is in the denominator, you can see how any speed, or x speed, will just cancel itself out. So the only remaining factor that matters is the average time that passes between each car. But is that it? You may have noticed that there's still plenty of time left in this video. Making assumptions to make the math easy and theoretical calculations is nice, but it also makes models less realistic. For instance, cars are not simple points of indeterminate size on a piece of paper. They're objects with a known length and width. What happens if we adjust the math to include more realistic conditions? The same formula still applies, but some changes are needed for the following distance. The length of the car itself must be factored in. Let's assume that the average length of a car is 5 meters. Running with these numbers, the result of the calculation is 1526 cars per hour. That's less than 1800, but no surprises there. The following distance increased due to changing the car from a point particle of indeterminate size to a set length. And what happens if we drop the speed from 50 kilometers per hour to 30 kilometers per hour? Oh my, the number is smaller. If math isn't your thing and you don't understand why, don't worry. Although the following distance changes accordingly with the speed, the length of the car stays the same. How quickly it takes a car to drive 5 meters depends on the speed. Faster cars will cover this ground quicker than slower cars. This phenomenon can be modeled with a graph. At 30 kilometers per hour, the flow capacity is 1383 cars per hour. Raising the speed 67% to 50 kilometers per hour leads to a modest rise of 10% to 1526 vehicles per hour. If you're well versed in mathematics, you'll see that as car speed approaches infinity, the impact of the 5 meter car length becomes negligible, and we can start to think of cars as points of indeterminate size. And logically, as speed approaches zero, cars per hour will also approach zero, since it will take slower cars longer and longer to traverse an average car length. So yes, in perfect traffic conditions, it is true that large increases in speed can achieve modest increases in capacity. But consider this. If just one car out of five maintains a following distance of three seconds instead of two, that changes the average following distance to 2.2 seconds. That change alone drops capacity to around 1400 pretty much undoing any gains that raising the speed from 30 km per hour to 50 km per hour offered. And that's before thinking about the effects of merging and braking. The real world is a messy place, and the messiness of traffic is enough to reverse the small gains of a perfect theoretical system. Okay, so that covers the effects of speed in a free flow system. So what about a stop and go system? Well, we already know from the last video that it is the intersection, not the lane itself, that determines capacity in stop and go traffic. So the speed in the traffic lane shouldn't matter either. But this is a good opportunity to cover how intersections affect speed. The most common complaint I noticed in the comments under the last video was that some people said they didn't want to get stuck behind other cars if there was only a single lane between intersections. Well, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but the truth is, if you're driving in a stop and go system, you're already stuck, even if you drive aggressively. That's because even if you manage to speed ahead of other cars, you and the traffic behind you are more than likely to get stuck at the next red light. 
and even if you get lucky and manage to skip a red, the subsequent traffic lights will stop you from getting too far ahead of the traffic behind you. So even if you drive very aggressively for 10 minutes, the biggest lead you might gain is around a minute or so. To demonstrate this, we went back to Douglas Boulevard to measure the average speed of travel between Vernon Street and Woodridge Way, which is around 6.3 kilometers. In this trial, the driver was asked to drive 10 laps between the two streets and to log the time of each lap. Even though the speed limit for most of the environment ranges between 45 to 50 miles per hour, the average speed we calculated from those 10 laps was around 30 miles per hour. So whether you're driving on a single lane stuck behind someone at 30 miles per hour with minimal stop and go, or using multiple lanes to accelerate around everyone in the dash to the next intersection, it doesn't really make a difference. Both environments will take around a similar amount of time to drive through, except one of those scenarios is kinder to your brake pads and city budget. So let's recap what we've learned. Higher traffic speeds do not increase the capacity of the road. In a free flow system, any modest theoretical gain from higher speeds are wiped away from inefficiencies of imperfect traffic flow. And in a stop and go system, higher average speeds are made impossible from, well, the traffic being stop and go. I hope that this video was helpful, and I'll see you all in the next one.